So now we're going to actually open it up to the different library sites. So what, we're, what we'll do is we will take uh, two questions from each library and we'll do that in alphabetical order. So, and we'll continue to do this until we run out of time. So the first site, the first library is Brawley. Is Brawley there? We are here and we have been listening rapidly. Okay. Um, two questions. First one is, how long did it take you to get back to where you are today after your accident? No. Um, well, I had my accident. I don't know if you called it an accident or a crisis or a what, well, whatever it was. That was on the 2nd of September, uh, 2003. And I'm still working at it. Um, repairing your brain after it's damaged is not a quick fix sort of thing. Um, my reading ability is, runs at about one mile an hour. My speaking ability runs about 80 miles an hour if I'm not tired or stressed. And my thinking capacity runs uh, in the 90s because that's the part of my brain that's the least damaged. Now, I have to coordinate all those three parts running at different speeds together so I can function in the world as we know it. That's how it is for me right now. And I probably will be working at this for I don't know how long. Um, and I don't care how long because I'll keep on doing it until I've got everything in order. I don't know if that's answered your question. I, I thank you very much. And one more quick question. Sure. And I've, I've been chosen the, the reader of the questions. I'm the one who has a big mouth and I'm brave. <laughs> um, and one of our people here would like to know uh, what your next book is going to be about. Oh, my next book? I'm halfway through. And that is about my ride around the country on the bicycle, the um, 12,000 mile ride that took me eight months as I learned wow. so much in that. At first I thought that the bike ride was for myself to, to prove to myself that I was whole again and I could do things. And it was partly that, but after the first month or so, I realized this journey is not for me as much as it is for other brain injured people. Because I met so many. I mean, I thought I was being original with this brain injury, but so many people have had it, accidents, whatever, strokes, whatever. And I found that they found it a very inspirational thing to find that someone who'd walked in their shoes could get back on their feet, could get out and do what they want. I mean, you might not want to ride a bike, but that's just the thing that I wanted to do. If, if you want to do anything, you can do it. And so that's what my ride uh, became after a, after a few months was to help other people who were struggling in the position that I had been in. Okay, thank you, thank you Brawley. Okay, now we'll go on to Modesto. Do you have two questions for Modesto? Uh, yes. One question is, do you have any other goals right now? Yes, I'm going to learn Braille. Um, my eyesight is fading some what and I want to be prepared and when I can no longer read with my eyes I want to read with my fingers because nothing and I mean nothing is going to stop me from reading or writing or learning or going to the library ever hmm. so uh, that's one of the things that uh, I'm about to start John do you have a question Yes, I have one question here in Modesto, and that is, um, what was the biggest single consistent problem you had on your trip? Cars. Did you have one problem seem to crop up every day, or? Uh, uh, they were, it was um, vehicles, cars, trucks. Uh, it sounds very boring, but that's the thing that scares you the most. It, it is terrifying, some of the rides. I got ridden off the road twice in uh, Louisiana by logging trucks and um, you know you ch choose the small roads and everything so you know I'm not going on a big freeway or a yeah, but, but even these small roads they just had two lanes and the cars uh, uh, the trucks come one way and the other way and, you, and there's no place there's no shoulder on the side to go 
So when a truck passes you, if it's passing another truck, it pushes you right to the edge. And in uh, Louisiana, um, the edge of the road, you go to the edge of the road and then it goes down an, an embankment like this. And they just push you right down, you just go flying down the embankment. It was just, it was, it was real scary. Wow. So cars are the most scary thing. Everything else is right, fun, thank you. except the cars. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, Modesto. Okay, next we will go to Nevada City. Nevada City, are you there? Uh, yes, we're here. Uh, thank you very much, Megan, for uh, putting on this uh, very, very nice event to uh, visit with you this evening. Thank you. Uh, question we had, one of them is, uh, uh, when you were setting up your bicycle ride, uh, did you schedule that out where you uh, had certain meetings and certain places to be at certain times and, and the people that you uh, were going to be introduced to or that you knew already? Um, well, the first question, I had started out with a book and it was my brilliant idea to promote this book as we went along. So. We had a lot of Barnes and Noble people and that, that we would stop out to do the book signings. But you have to be there on certain days at certain times. And uh, this was really, really difficult for me because it's very hard to judge how to get from one place to another, especially if they're hundreds of miles apart, uh, several hundred miles apart, because you don't know about the weather. You might be riding real w well one day and then the next day you have a headwind and you can go like four or five miles an hour, you know, so how are you going to get from one place to another? That was very stressful and we kept that, um, that uh, signing thing going until we got to Washington DC. That was about 2,000 miles of the trip. But after that I, I kind of stopped it most of the way because it was just too difficult to get from one place to another on the bike by yourself and when I got into towns was to you know it was horrendous but it was very interesting the first part you know we had some fun at a lot of the uh, Barnes and Noble places and that but it was just too difficult to keep up with that and what was the other question? Uh, second question was uh did you always stay in motels or did you get to stay with people and meet new people in the various communities that you uh, stopped at? I'm, I, I'm just laughing because it wasn't, um, no, I stayed in the most peculiar amount of thing, places. I stayed in hotels and motels usually the night before I had a book signing because I had to get kind of my hair washed and my face wiped clean and stuff like that. But. Most of the other time I, I um, had a tent, so I used to camp anywhere. Uh, I found a good place to camp. I don't like camping in the uh, campgrounds because they're too noisy and they're very expensive, some of them. And so I was doing this trip on absolutely nothing. I found, where do you bury people? In the, in the cemetery? Cemetery, excuse me, I keep losing my words, so I have to ask you guys to help me. Cemeteries were some of the greatest places to camp. One, because those guys there are real quiet. <laughs> they don't bother you. There's always water because they water plants and stuff a lot. And there was always place, a place I could find to put my cell phone in to charge it. So, uh, yeah, cemeteries are a real good place to, um, <laughs> to camp. And I, I stayed in a hundred of other weird places I stayed in. A lot of churches were very kind. They let me uh, pitch my camp on the... On the uh, on the church grounds and a lot of them, um, especially the Methodist churches, I don't know why the Methodist churches, but they have a um, usually some kind of sporting event or something and they have showers, hot showers. I mean, when somebody gave me a hot shower, it was like giving me a million bucks. <laughs> it was great. Okay, thank you, Nevada City. Okay, now we will move on to Pasadena. Pasadena, are you there? Hello, Pasadena. Hi, Lori. We have uh, a couple of questions for Megan. The first one is, Megan, did you form any kind of a support group for survivors of brain aneurysms, or do you belong to such a group? We don't belong to such a group because we found this is the one thing uh, 
in the country that I really think needs um, some attention. There are so many people in so many towns that need help. There's so many stroke victims and, and uh, um, accident victims, and they have no place to go. And uh, we're trying very hard to try and coordinate some of those. In some towns, like in um, Midland, Texas, there's a wonderful place for aneurysm, uh, for, for um, what's the other word I want? Hmm. Stroke uh, victim? F, uh, no, the word for, for uh, when you can't understand words. Aphasia, aphasia groups. Um, and then we, we, we found a couple of others that were great, but they're very far and few, few and far between. And there are so many people that need help, and I, I really hope that uh, talks like the one I'm doing now will be able to help that. Okay. And one of our adult learners is going to ask a question. Okay, Marina. Hi. My name is Marina. Hi, Marina. Um, my, one, my one question is, how did you get through the first uh, few months after the brain aneurysm? The first few months, um, well, for the first two weeks, I didn't know anything. Um, and then it was just very, very scary because y y you don't know what's wrong with you. And I've always been a person that's helped myself. And the most scary thing for me was I did not know how to help myself in this case. And um, you just have to keep, keep, keep on finding it, finding your way around. And um, it's just very difficult, but you just have to keep your spirit up and you have to keep, uh, keep up your courage and you will get there and you will find a way. Okay, thank you, Pasadena. Uh, next, we'll go to Sacramento Public Library. Are you there? Or here. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, um, our first question is, what was your life like to have given you such drive, a never give up mentality? I think I was just born with it. It's just never occurred to me to give up. I mean, what else? I don't know what else to do. <laughs> you just have to keep... Help me with this. Well, I, I do remember when you came to our literacy program and you went over that same program over and over yeah. and I told you I give you so much credit for that and, and you looked at me with this puzzled look and you said well what other choice do I have it's yeah. I have no other choice and and I, I found that very inspiring just in my own personal life as far as that goes so yeah it seems yeah. to be the only option I mean if you're down in a hole you got to climb back out so you just keep climbing mm -hmm. that's good Okay, our other question is, were you ever in any danger during the spike trip? Just by the trucks riding you off the road. Just by the trucks riding you off the road. It's, it, it was very, very scary. And um, uh, one thing I, I hope uh, people will uh, think about uh, when they ask me that question, uh, before I started, my friends, of course, told me I'm crazy, but then that's just you, so... You haven't changed much, but um, um, oh, sorry, the word has co completely gone out of my head. Help me. Uh, what did what was the question? Could you uh, repeat the question? You see, m things still fly out of my head when I'm when I'm not expecting them. So, can you just repeat it, please? That's a, sure. It, it was. Were you ever? It, did you ever feel that you were in danger on this bike trip? Oh, oh, I know what I was going to tell you. Yeah. My friends told me not to do it. It was crazy and everything, and, and you know, there's crazy people out there, and there's murderers and rapists, and, and people are going to knock you over the head, da, 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 da. I had nothing but kindness over the 12,000 miles around the whole country. And I think people should stop listening to all the media. I'm sure there's some bad people out there, but there's probably two of them to every 10 great people who are so kind and we had such fun and uh, I'm sorry I can't uh, tell you about any terrible people that try to shoot me or whatever you know 
So believe in that. When you go for a trip around the country, I'm t you'll just meet wonderful people. Americans are just so kind and generous, and it, it was really impressive. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We, we do have a third question, if we can. We just want to know the name of her book. Oh. Let Me Die Laughing. Uh, I chose the title because I was going into um, surgery and I was laughing and talking and the doctor was horrified. He, he said, you, this is a very serious operation. You're gonna, you, know, you could quite easily die and everything. And I said, well, if I'm going to die, let me die laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, actually, we wanted the, the name of your new book that you're the writing. The name of my new book. It doesn't have a name yet. You guys got oh. any, any ideas for a title? I'm open <laughs> for titles right now. An Amazing Journey. There you go. Okay, we got that one. Write that down, Nancy, An Amazing Journey. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we will go back to Brawley again. Brawley, do you have two more questions you'd like to ask Megan? I'm sorry. Um, we do have one more question. Um, one of our people here was wondering if you did you t take this bike ride completely by yourself, or did you have a chase car with you, or somebody that that met you periodically? No. When you go on adventure, you go by yourself. I went by myself. I did meet Nancy, my publisher in um, Washington D.C. because we had to go to a um, a book show there. And I had uh, two other friends, one in Washington uh, State and uh, another in the South uh, that I met. But those were the only people I knew that I, uh, that I met on my trip. Could we, um, um, one of the other people here would like to know how fast your recovery was from the surgery on your aneurysm? Um, the surgery, I had to wait a year before I could take this trip after the surgery because um, your brain is so traumatized. Mine first had the AVM and then a year later I had the actual surgery so that my brain was traumatized again. So it was wise to wait for the, the whole year to find out if everything was still, you know, where it should be and hadn't fallen down the wrong hole or whatever you call it, you know. So, uh, but I found the surgery uh, probably the least of the traumas of the whole, of the whole thing. The do I believed in the doctor. I wouldn't have gone into having the operation if I hadn't believed in him. And uh, the other thing that, that gave me confidence was I made the choice. Uh, by that time, I could speak, sort of. I could understand very well, and everyone knew I could understand. So it was my choice to have the operation, who to give me the, who, who uh, the guy was that was going to give me the operation. So I felt I had some control in that. And the doctor said I would be in hospital for probably two weeks after the surgery, and then I'd have to go into a th therapy thing probably for about a month. Well. I don't like hospitals, the food's bad, the noise is awful, you know. So I was in, um, what's the place you go into? A convalescent? No, 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 no. When you right come out of the, out of an operation into the... In the intensive care. In, intensive, I was in intensive care and I came to about three days after because they keep you knocked out so you don't move around. And uh, two days after that, I uh, said to the doctor, okay, I'm ready to go home. He said, you can't go home, you're in intensive care. I said, I'm ready. And so he, he just shakes his head because he knew how obstinate I was. So I, I said, well, I got to deal with you, doc. You bring in all the, um, the therapists and that to check you out. And if they say it's okay, then is that a deal? He said, that's a deal. So all the therapists come marching in and I have to do this and, you know, the physical stuff and reading stuff and everything. And um, everything was okay and they were astonished. And I went home uh, and I lived by myself um, less than a week wow. from the uh, surgery. And um, every, again, everyone thought I was crazy, but um, I was fine. And um, well, the only thing I was disappointed with with the surgery, I thought I'd go home and I'd be very impressive with my friends. I'd have this, this 
hair, because I had my surgery here, I thought I'd have this, you know, my head all shaved off and this great big thing, and I, you know, I'd really show off. They do it so well these days. There was hardly any change in my hair except at the back here. I looked like one of those priests because they have to um, have to drain your head at the back, so I have to shave a big, quite a big piece of hair. But all my hair was exactly where it looked like. And I said to them, "Bring the shavers and shave my head. I can't go home looking <laughs> like this. They'll think, you know, I'm fooling them." But um, they didn't do that for me. So yeah, that was Modesto, right? I've lost my place here. Was that no, Modesto? That was Brawley. That was Brawley. Brawley. Okay, was Brawley. We're, we, we're going on to Modesto. Modesto, are you there? Yes. Oh. Um, what is your health prognosis, and is your eyesight part of it? Um, my health, I've never been so healthy in my life. Uh, my trip on my bike around the country, I didn't have one ache, one pain, one headache, one anything. And... Um, the doctor, uh, Dr. Sue, who did my brain surgery, says that he took out everything that should be taken out, and I'm fine. My eyesight, I've lost the vision, like I, I've lost a peripheral, what is it? Peripheral? Peripheral vision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I really, I still need help with my words. Um, that, that, they said, w w really wouldn't come back, but it is coming back. Very, very slowly. I went to have an eye test done a couple of months ago, and the doctor fell out of his chair. He said, I can't believe this happens. So I've lost, I'm, I, I'm getting the peripheral vision back. My problem with my sight is just because I'm about 100 years old, and that's what happens <laughs> to people when they're 100 years old. That's why I'm losing um, some sight to, to read, and that is difficult. But it's nothing to do with the accident. Do you have a second question? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, your story is amazing. And have you told uh, like Hollywood producers or anything? Because so many people need to hear this wonderful story. Good. You want a job? You can, <laughs> you can go to Hollywood and tell them about it. Yeah, I would, I, I would like to um, do something with a story um, because I think it can be helpful um, to other people, and that's why I would like to do it. But right now, um, um, I haven't really had time to get into that. I, I, my, my most important thing to do now is to complete the second book, and then maybe I'll take your advice and I'll go to Hollywood. <laughs> okay, uh, Nevada City, are you there? Do you have two more questions? Uh, yes, uh, you answered one of them uh, regarding the uh, how long you were in the hospital and that sort of thing. Uh, but we had a second one. Uh, did you at any time experience uh, physical difficulties, uh, uh, lack of mobility, uh, uh, you know, non-functioning of arms and legs and that sort of thing, or grasp or whatever? No. And that was the thing. When you have a serious brain injury like I did and lots of things were wrong, um, it gives no idea that there's anything wrong with you. You know, you look absolutely normal and nobody knows uh, what um, torment is going on inside your head at the time because you look so normal. And um, as far as it... My brain injury is on this side, and that's to do with the reading, writing, and speaking. Oh, the physical side was perfect. I could still do all the yoga that I do often and all that sort of thing. I mean, I can, when, uh, I mean, they checked me out, and I'd stand on one leg or on, you know, I couldn't stand on my head because that, <laughs> couldn't do that for about a year because that wasn't too cool to do, but, but I had all my balance and everything. So nothing affected, nothing about, nothing of that was affected. Did you have a second question? No, that was, uh, that was the only one we had. Okay, all right. Only well. one? <laughs> Jeez. Okay, then we'll go to Pasadena. Pasadena, do you have a couple more questions for Megan? Yes, 
Hi, Megan. One of the Hi. ladies uh, who's from Australia wants to know, where were you born? Rhodesia in southern Africa. It's now called Zimbabwe, which is a place you don't want to go to. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I have another question. Yes. When you first came to the literacy program, do you have any suggestions, anything that library literacy programs, anything that we could do better, if we could structure it differently, something that would make it easier for you or more comfortable uh, for an adult learner? Well, I've only been to one literacy group, and that was um, Lori's, and she was so magnificent that if you want to learn how to do anything to run, <laughs> she's the one to speak to because she does everything. She was so, the thing that I noticed was the kindness and the time that she took to listen to me. It's very important to be listened to because I think if you have a reading problem, whether it's one of mine or maybe uh, circumstances in your life you couldn't get to read because of school problems or whatever. It's, it's a very, uh, you need to be listened to because you, it, it's, what's the word I want you very, not scared. Patience. Not you're timid. You, you're timid mm -hmm. and you, you, you're intimidated actually mm -hmm. by society because uh, reading is essential to exist. And, um, and then people look down on you if you can't read. And so this is what uh, Lori helped me with. I went in there and I was a little bit defensive and uh, expecting, you know, to be kind of slapped in the face and kind of thing. But she, she sat down and she listened. And she listened well while I jabba, jabba, jabba. And then she uh, suggested things. And then she was firm with me when she saw ways that she could help me, but I didn't want to accept. But she just kept on and on um, telling me about it and how it would help me and I should think about it and then um, that's what people need, I think, to be, to be made to feel confident in themselves and they can do this thing. That is, if they haven't done it until they're quite you know, until they are an adult, I think it's more scary because reading and stuff are things that little kids do, that they, you learn then. So when, you, when you're an adult and you haven't got that gift yet, I think it's, it's, it's very scary. So the way that Laurie helped me was wonderful. Yeah, well, thank you. So on the other hand, do you have any advice for adult learners? For people new, just coming to the program, do you have any advice to give them? People who might be hesitant to uh, be in a literacy program for adults? You, you won't know the value of it until you've uh, stayed in literacy program. It, the value is just so enormous. And if you turn it down, you're turning yourself down. So just go in there meet the people, swallow your pride if that's what's stopping you, and just uh, start reading. And realize that this is not going to be something that's completed in a week or two weeks. It's going to take time. And prepare yourself for that. But while you're doing it, it's not a... a um, my journey in, re in rereading and having to learn the alphabet back uh, again, you know, the whole thing. It wasn't boring. It was very interesting. I learned a lot. And you find how to ask questions and all sorts of things like that. I just don't, I don't know of any, any, um, anything that, that would be on the downside of, of, of a literacy program. I just would like to encourage everybody who's thinking of going to start to start one and start to learn to read and write, that you will just find your whole world is going to just expand enormously, and just go with it. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome.
Okay, Sacramento, are you there? We are, thank you. Uh, Megan, first of all, we just want to say how much we've all thoroughly enjoyed meeting you, hearing you speak. Your words are so inspiring. And uh, again, thank you to you and Lori for coming here this evening to share with us. Um, two questions. What, Megan, originally brought you to the United States? I'm just a traveling lady. I, um, <laughs> my godfather died and left me um, 500 pounds, so those are British pounds, so I think they were about, I don't know how much, in American money, and uh, I took that money and came to America, but I only had enough money to come one way. So um, I had to work my way around the country and then I enjoyed myself so much and found it such a, I loved the openness of America because I was brought up, brought up in a British type thing in Africa where everything's very strict and everything and I loved the American way of openness and, um, and it, it was so wonderful that after a few months I said, oh well I'm not going back, I'm staying here. <laughs> so here I am. And you came when you were how old? Uh, 21. You have mm -hmm. to be 21 before they allow you to come into the country by yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, actually I turned 21 and I was in Italy and uh, I had my cards and everything to come to America. I was just waiting for that 21st day to come and so it did and so I left from Italy and came here. Okay, next question. Oh, we're so glad you did. Thank you. Uh, one other question. Do you have another bike trip planned in the future? Yeah, I want to go. I haven't been to the northern um, part of Europe. Uh, um, where was the Where was the um, the Cold War? In Germany? No, no, not Germany. That's the Second World War. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, the 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 the. the uh, who knows? Come on, people, help me. I'm stuck here. I know what it is, and I can't say it. In Russia? Yes, okay. Russia. Okay. I have not been to Russia, and I want very much to ride uh, around Russia. Oh. That's a long way to ride, so I'm, I'm not going the whole way, but I'd like to go part of it. Okay, this is our last round of questions, so I'm going to open it up uh, to just one question per library. So we'll go back to Brawley. Well, now I have to make a decision, but um, one of the gentlemen here asked, says that in many cultures, after an experience like this, um, you're, you, you're, dis you, you're given a new name or you deserve a new name, and he was wondering what name you would choose if you were going to choose a new name for yourself. I thought the other people were supposed to choose you the name. Am I, am I, am I, and am I allowed to choose my own name? Ask, sure. ask that person. Yeah. Yes, he, sa he says you can. I can? You'll have to get back yes. to me on that. Have you got any ideas what I should be called? <laughs> <laughs> Not off the top of my head. <laughs> anyone, anyone in your place got an idea for me? No, but since you can't answer that one, I'll give you another qu really quick one, and this is on a lighter note also. Um, one of my uh, viewers here wanted to know that since chicken is so important to you and it was the only word you could remember, they wanted to know if you eat chicken. Oh, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> And that was the problem because when the only word you have is chicken, there's not much you can do with the chicken and people keep wanting to bring you fried chicken. And um, that, was, <laughs> that was difficult. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. We certainly You're appreciated welcome. it. All right. How about Modesto? Do you have one final question for Megan? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Megan. Yeah. You don't have a question? Oh, come on. <laughs> No. Okay, then we'll go to Nevada City. Uh, does that mean I can take two? <laughs> yeah, you can have two. Okay, <laughs> okay. I have two. Okay, the first good. one is, uh, how has your book been received, uh, and are you satisfied with uh, the reception from the public? Yes, the people that have bought the book um, have received it well, and um, what I'm really excited about is that the hospitals like it, like the uh, Loma Linda, the hospital I had my brain uh, surgery done, uh, 
they, um, Dr. Sue really, that was my surgeon, um, really enjoyed the book. It had a big part of him in it. Maybe that's why he enjoyed it. <laughs> but it's hanging up in Loma Linda and they bought about 20 copies to give to uh, the students and, um, and uh, people like that, to give them some idea of what brain injury is from the inside. See, the doctors always have it from the outside. They know how to fix the parts and stuff like that, but they have no idea what the emotional uh, uh, stress is that you have when you're going through um, brain surgery. And that was, that, what, that was what my book was about. It was about the emotional uh, side of brain surgery. The uh, second question is, is kind of a follow-up to the gentleman who asked about doing a movie. Uh, have you been invited to do much uh, motivational speaking, such as this event? Uh, and that seems like uh, certainly a venue that would uh, reach a lot of people and, and have uh, a tremendous uh, favorable impact. Yes, we're working on that now, and we're really hoping that uh, we will get more and more uh, chances to be able to express um, um, the story of brain injury. And I would really like to be able to help uh, to uh, involve other people with it, uh, not just myself, because mine is just one side of it, but I'd like to get the speech therapists in to explain and the caregivers. I think if we all got together and uh, spoke, uh, so many more questions will be answered and so much more help will be given. So we're trying very much to get that whole thing together. Okay, how about Pasadena? Do you have a final question for Megan? Yes, we do. Megan, now I know you said when Lori first wanted to get you on the computer, you were not too enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. Now, have, do you have a blog or a website or anything now? Um, no, I don't, because I still have great difficulty in uh, reading. And um, all if I have a blog site or whatever you call them, I'd have to read all that, and I can't do it. I have to devote all my reading time to writing right now because I... I uh, do you understand what I mean about my writing problem? Or you don't quite understand? I, I think I do, but go, Okay, go let, let me do something for you. You've heard me speak and see how I speak. Now I'm going to read just a couple of words to you so you can understand what that difficulty is with me uh, right now. Auntie. Give me something to read. Okay. Thanks, I'm af afraid that all we have, I'm only going to read you that because you'll be able to understand, but that is reading at really high speed for me, and it's improved enormously because I couldn't read a word when I started. But um, when I write, if I write a page and I have to reread it, it's going to take me an hour sometimes to just reread a page that I've written. So now you understand the problem that I have with reading. It's not so much a problem as a challenge. And it is improving slowly. Uh, you should have heard me try to read those few words a year ago. Boy, we'd be here still at dinner time trying to get through. <laughs> so did that, ask, uh, did that answer your question? I yeah. uh, beg your pardon? I, that, was our, that was our only question. Okay. Okay, and Thank finally, you. Sacramento. Uh, Megan, do you think that riding your bike and your physical activity is attributed to the, the regeneration and better circulation in your brain and your throughout your body? Very, very, very much so. And my surgeon told me in the beginning, you know, you've got to exercise. And, that, and I, I've always exercised. I've always been athletic. But I had no idea what exercise does to benefit you. 
until I had this brain injury. And um, when I have problems re uh, writing, I can still only write for an hour or so at a time, then I have to uh, rest because my brain gets tired, but my physical body does not. So I, I write, and then when I have to take a, um, a break, I go and do physical, something physical. I do yoga or I, I go for walks or I run or something like that, and I can come back and, and uh, my brain has been repowered, so to speak. So, uh, yeah, I can't, I can't tell you how important exercise has been for me and would be to other people as well. Not only for brain, um, helping your brain, but everything else um, health-wise. Okay, well, uh, I'd like to uh, thank all the five libraries that have been there. And uh, I do have one last question, and I want it to be quick because I know what they're in, but the one thing I wanted to ask you is, what do you want people to remember most about Megan Timothy, real quickly? <laughs> that she's a nutcase and she's <laughs> having a great life. <laughs> all yeah. right. Uh, I'd like to, on behalf of the California Library Literacy Services, I would like to thank the five libraries for uh, joining us tonight. And also thanks to the fundraisers, the, the um, Institute for, uh, for Museum and Library Science Services in Washington, D.C., and to AT&T for in-kind support. Uh, please tell your fellow tutors and learners who might have missed this event that they can watch it archived on the web in about a week at uh, libraryliteracy.org. And uh, please don't forget to fill out the evaluation forms and leave it with your host librarian. Now I'm going to ask the libraries to unmute the microphones for a moment and please give Megan a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Uh, And now, good night from Palomar College in San Marcos. Good night.